All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's first premiere of What's Next. My name is Matthew Quinn. I'm going to be your host. And we're going to look at uh, the question of what's next with the theater community, uh, ranging from what's next with theater to streaming, uh, the, the venues, diversity. Uh, and the show is looking to hopefully answer your questions, um, give you some more information, give you a place that you can... Uh, turn to when talking about what's next. Um, and we'd love to hear your comments and any of your questions up here. Uh, if you're on YouTube or if you are in uh, Facebook, you feel free to use the chat, uh, ask any questions that you may have for our guests. Um, and if you're on YouTube and you're interested, please subscribe to the Combined Art Form channel. Uh, we're gonna be coming out with uh, many more shows and different types of entertainment. Uh, so we look forward to having you as a subscriber. Um, so when the world changed in mid-March, um, like many others in the theater community, my world was turned upside down uh, as venues closed, festivals canceled, special events canceled, uh, and it really changed everything, what everybody was looking to do in terms of their what's next. Uh, and while most of us were trying to make sense of this and, and, and kind of get our lives straight, um, there were a few individuals out there, a few people really taking steps to challenge and, and face these challenges uh, and, and really didn't miss a beat in terms of entertaining people and, and working with their art. Um, and so I looked out to these people for help and uh, found many of them who were willing to help. Um, and in particular, I was very interested for the streamers, uh, the live streamers who were really streaming live shows. This wasn't taking a video and putting it up there, something that they did years ago. These were artists who were actually performing live in front of camera, working with other artists in front of camera and putting it live for everyone out there to see it. Um, so today, uh, for my first premiere episode of What's Next. I'm very excited uh, to have two of these individuals um, who were really pioneers in the field. And what makes them extra special is they both have gone out of the way to help other artists uh, tackle this streaming online uh, world. And so without any further ado, I'd like to call out uh, our wonderful guest for the first show, uh, Mr. Peter Michael Marino uh, and Andrew Schmedeke. Sh How are you? All right. Well, Very nice. Look at you guys. Let's go into a little, uh, little see your names there. There you are. Look at you guys. Well, thank you so much for coming on the first show. Um, and of course, you got excellent tech up, your cameras, everything. You look great. Um, so Peter Michael Marino, you are in New York City. You're a director, producer, writer, teacher, performing artist. Um, I've known you for a while as the great fringer. You have fringed like in five different continents uh, across the world, uh, Edinburgh, uh, Hollywood Fringe. Um, you were just recently on Broadway, uh, Pips Island, off-Broadway. Off oh. broad, so, yeah, off. off. Uh, it's, it's all the same right now. One off. Off, <laughs> yeah, one off. Off Broadway uh, is the villain in Pips Island, um, and and a pioneer for streaming. So thank you for coming. Thank you. And Andrew Schmedeke, um, you here. You are based in LA, so we got kind of a bi-coastal show here. You are an award-winning lighting designer for theater, dance, and live events. Um, and you've done everything from operas to ballet to cruise ships, haunted houses, TED Talks. Uh, and presently, as I mentioned, you're here in, in L.A. and you're lecturing part time at UC Berkeley and also have become an increase, uh, a pioneer uh, with the live streaming. UC Santa um, Barbara, but close. What's that? UC Santa Barbara, actually. Oh, you see, what did I say? Uh, okay, Berkeley, but no, it's, it's, it's all California summer. It's all, I got to make one mistake for each guest <laughs> to keep it fair. We're I'm about, I'm about the fair. That. So let's go back to March. We're all living our lives. And then suddenly, boom, COVID hits and we're locked down. Uh, Peter, how, what was the change? What how did you go from performing live around the world 
off Broadway to suddenly streaming uh, from your apartment in New York City? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm one of those people that like, I mean, I was here for 9-11. So like when, and I was born during a blackout. So when like stuff gets weird, I just like go into, I, I go into action mode as opposed to like retreat mode. And I had been, um, so Desperately Seeking the Exit, I, I hadn't done since like 2014, maybe 2013, after like a very long world run of it. And this um, is your solo show. Yeah, it's my solo show uh, about my experience writing a musical with Debbie Harry. Um, and uh, Frigid was had a festival about a week before, a week and a half before. We were starting to sense that maybe something was happening. Audiences were getting smaller. People were starting to think, I should stay home. And uh, they had an open spot at the last minute. They said, you know, we have a spot and wants to do something. So I just pulled out that old script for Desperately Seeking the Exit, and I just read it on stage. Hmm. And people, <laughs> like, loved it. Uh, also, you know, I hadn't looked at it, so I didn't really I didn't care as much. So I just had fun with it. And then when this all happened, that script was still out on my desk. So it just, I don't, I, it just made sense. I went, well, I've got this. And I just started looking at all these things called platforms that I didn't know anything about. And <laughs> Zoom was the winner because I had to do it. And I had to hear the audience. Mm -hmm. And then I just made it happen. And then the kids show, I was scheduled to do it in Hollywood um, in April, maybe. June, June, June Fringe. Oh no, you were coming separately, not French, right? Yeah, right I don't. Yeah, I'd rather. Sometimes I'd rather save the money and lose it on my own, <laughs> rather than uh, pay for it. And uh, yeah, so that was a stage show I've been doing for two years, and it's very interactive. Um, literally, children coming on stage, touching things, moving things, mm -hmm. and it took me like four weeks to figure out how to adapt that hmm. uh, for this. So both of these shows, again, you started live, you had toured them live, and you went through an adaption process to actually bring them uh, online. And and to this point, how many show, how many times have you performed these live? Almost forty total. Wow! Because the kids' show wound up spinning off into birthday shows. Mm hmm. <laughs> sure. Personalized birthday shows. Um, so yeah, with the, with the birthday shows uh, and previews, I had lots of previews that I you know didn't charge people for, um, and uh, yeah, it was about forty total. And also, just to note, these shows. While I mentioned earlier in my intro that there's a sense of live theater where you're actually performing it live at the time, and you also don't record them. So basically, once you've done the show, it's gone very much like live theater. Yeah, that was my whole thing going into this. Um, subconsciously made the decision that I wouldn't record, I wouldn't save anything because I never have in the past. I've never mm -hmm. hired someone to videotape my shows unless I had to make a trailer. Um, but like, I don't think anyone's ever watched any of my shows on video. So okay. I, I just made that choice to not do it. But mm -hmm. what came out of it was that what I was actually doing was bringing people together anyway. Um, in this space mm -hmm. uh, and zoom seemed to be the best way for for people to see other people like you do in the yep. real theater and for the yep. for to hear their reactions and for the audience to hear each other's reactions yeah that's great and we'll talk a little bit more about that magic word platforms um but now let's turn to andrew so andrew you actually have a, kind of a different story you have been kind of working on this uh with the companies that you work with uh most of this technology has been out for years and years uh talk a little bit about what you did before and then how you guys all kind of transitioned of course well as you mentioned in my bio i'm when I started off in my career, I was a lighting designer. I only work with lighting. And now I work as a stream engineer or stream designer, someone who actually creates environments for people to go ahead and live stream live performances. And that kicked off kind of with my involvement with a group called Pixel Playhouse, who I've actually got the logo up here if you want to share my screen sometime. All right. And they are actually a live streaming channel on Twitch.tv. Ah, uh, you got to watch that there. button. Yeah, that was like a nice lead and countdown for your... Uh, <laughs> Very there exciting. We go. No, there's, there we go. But yeah, so this was originally a live streaming platform for people to go ahead and watch live musical theater cabaret from Los Angeles 
led by our producers VJ Nazareth here in the foreground and Graham Wetterhan here in the background with our mascot Hudson, the little fuzzy guy in the back. <laughs> and originally this was just my producer Graham's second bedroom that we built out into a home studio. And I was the lighting designer for the channel. So we spec'd out this set of pipe and drape. We put up some lights, put up some practicals in the style that I kind of enjoyed as well as this LED tape. And we created live musical theater cabarets with a cast of around four to five people twice a week. And it was starting to build traction on Twitch.tv. We were starting to go ahead and build up out of the, the actual channel launch back in October of 2019. And then March 12th hits and Center Theater shuts down and all gatherings are banned in Los Angeles of more than six people outside of your household. And even this small version of live streaming performance is no longer feasible. And so our solution be, started to become, okay, how do we pivot out of this? How do we go ahead and start to create remote productions? which are at least live productions, but with remote studios for every performer to be able to have their own socially distant and COVID safe place to broadcast their performances. Mm -hmm. And that pivoted into our first production, which was uh, The Importance of Being Earnest, which yep. launched April 18th, barely a month after we got shut down in terms of Valley Theater in Los Angeles, we were already out there producing work like this, which is, if you wanna, let me pick like a quick clip, which was, all of these characters live, a live pianist, as well as I believe eight cast members in the importance of being artist, all broadcasting from their own homes. That's amazing. I remember seeing this uh, on Twitch. It was what kind of made me want to connect with you. Um, and this was like a full two hour plus production. And you use several technologies, which I know we're going to look at later, talking about platforms, uh, OBS and Skype and some of the others out there, correct? Absolutely. So we can go ahead and cut out my screen share. But at least that's the introduction of how we got into this, how my pivot began from lighting design into stream design. When I sat down for my first meeting, went, okay, none of our cast have lights beyond the lights in their home. So how, what's my role going to be? I had started doing some research on NDI platforms, how streamers had started to actually start to take video feeds from a Skype call or video call for panels like this. I thought, okay, how can we leverage this technology that already exists and use it to create theater online? So excellent. Yeah, no, that was a great performance. It was wonderful. It was up there for a little bit. And is it still out there? If I were to share that link, could that be something I put in the notes later? Of course, yes. I can get you a link to it. It's still out there as a video on demand on the channel. And so it's still available for people to watch what we did back in April. We've been hard at work since then, done more productions of the time since then. But I'm happy to talk about that later and not take up all the time right now. Okay, great. Well, I know you've got a lot more, so that's wonderful. Thank you for that. Let's switch back over here. All right, so as you saw, there's like a lot going on here, a lot of possibilities with it. And I want to get into tech, but before we kind of dive into the tech questions and 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 uh, your comments on that. Um, when streaming first came out, there was a lot of back and forth in the streaming community, uh, the theater community, about should people be streaming? Should theaters actually start streaming? Some people said this is taken away from theater. It will never replace theater. We shouldn't waste our time. It's just video. They're just playing movies. Um, and so there was a lot of debate. And both of you guys, I, I noted, were kind of uh, uh, on the forefront of kind of talking about this. And let me actually start with Peter, because you kind of took a different approach uh, on discussing this. And this is well into like you performing for several weeks online. You came up with a rather satirical piece on Medium that we'll also post up there. Can you talk a little bit about that? <laughs> Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, I like to push buttons. And honestly, uh, the piece that I wrote, I wrote it in response to gatekeepers. Um, and in my world, gatekeepers are uh, Variety, New York Times, Hollywood Reporter, um, Time Out, mm -hmm. um, who I just felt were not actually giving any press to people who, like Andrew and myself, who were like literally creating art, <laughs> like <laughs> right there that uh, um, that wants to be theater, that is trying so hard to make it feel theatrical and not like we're watching a movie or you know a, a weird TikTok video or something like that. <laughs> um, so I wrote it for that reason, but yeah, the title of it is "I Don't Want to Watch Your Online Theater Show." And uh, it kind of just, yeah, it kind of just goes on and on about like what you're doing isn't theater. I'm sorry, it's not, it's not theater. Theater is, you know, spending tons of money and waiting online for bathrooms and having people eat next to you. Theater is, so I picked up like all the things we hate about theater um, and listed all that. 
And, uh, you know, it's not until the very end of the article that you realize that it's satirical because my bio says Peter is currently performing. <laughs> you know, um, I think like 8,000 people read that thing. Wow. Um, yeah. You also were able to tell a medium how far they read and people mm -hmm. didn't at the bottom. So I, you know, lost Twitter followers because they thought, it's not with this guy. Um, yeah, uh, I thought that was important. Yeah. Like, we're talking about it and you know and shortly after that i got a review uh i think it was for desperately seeking the exit where the critic said ladies and gentlemen this is theater I, was hmm. like, I made it happen. yes yeah so, yeah oh that was great it was a lot of fun and it was fun reading all the comments uh that that, that came from that yeah. uh and and likewise andrew you also kind of use uh facebook as kind of a stand uh, platform to kind of voice your opinion of, of this kind of debate going on with the theater community. You want to talk a little bit about that? Of course. I, I was very outspoken a few times <laughs> on Facebook in response to both criticism from the LA Times as well as from people I'm watching in our LA theater community who are reticent to go ahead and acknowledge the circumstances that we're in, which is that for the foreseeable future, you were not going to be able to gather in large groups. I know that the Berkshires have their production of Godspell happening, and it looks horrifying to watch people perform with that many plastic screens around them, but bless them, <laughs> let them have a chance. But for the vast majority of us who live in municipalities that are as large as Los Angeles and New York, we're not going to be able to get together and gather in the way that we're used to or the way that we acknowledged we had physical productions. And that applies not just to theater, but also to comedy tours, to musicals, to opera, to everything I worked in beforehand. There's no more physical experience in that way. And what I've tended to re sort of uh, reverberate against and dislike is that both there's a pragmatic lack of an awareness that we need to find a way to give jobs and give employment and get creative outlets to our artists, both actors and designers, and the method to do that that I've discovered is streaming remotely. And that historically, we've also had a some sort of un inability to understand that there has been a move away from physical entertainment into digitized entertainment in a variety of different platforms in the past. Mm -hmm. Television replaced theater already. It's live sporting, you still watch online, but there's still a value to going to get tickets. You can yeah. go ahead and watch Coachella online, but there's still a value to being there and present. The physical actual nature of being part of a crowd is not unique to theater, nor is it something that you're going to lose by bringing theater online. It's still just going to be a value added by being in the room where it happened. It's not, that doesn't detract from having an online access to your work. Yeah, and, and in fact, Peter, you were mentioning with, with Zoom, I mean, you need you are getting that interaction. And in some ways, you're even closer to the audience because their faces are right there in front of you. You're not looking back in a darkened theater. Yeah, well, that's another one of my things. I never have the house lights out. Like, <laughs> it's just mm -hmm. my thing. I, I just feel like for what I do, unless I'm doing Chekhov, which I will never do, I, I need to see the audience. Mm -hmm. it's me, like theater art brings people together. Yeah. So if I'm not communicating and looking in their eyes and responding to somebody blowing their nose or getting up and leaving, if I'm not <laughs> responding, it's like when someone's in a play and like they drop the gun and like everyone's just walking around the gun. You know, I'm the guy who's like, let me just pick up this gun first and pretend it never happened. You know, I'm <laughs> incapable of not being in the moment. So yeah, I had to have the audience there. Yeah. It, trial and error to to you know especially with zoom you can't over talk and um people show up to watch the show you know lounging in their chair you know just like in their underwear not realizing that we're, we can see that <laughs> their dishes, you know clearly watch, watch it and then hearing so that doesn't happen in the theater but what's fun is that it just me responding to it and the rest of the people seeing it it, we're all laughing at the same thing at the same yeah. time. So mission yeah. accomplished. You yeah. know? And th there's also something, I think what's great about this platform now is it's so new that our mistakes are actually enjoyable. <laughs> yeah. know, our glitches are fascinating um, because we're, we're so not in contact with humans anymore. But this is the most human thing we can get. Yep. Yeah. And, 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 Back with Andrew, um, I, I, I saw specifically in Clue, which you didn't really talk about. I love that interaction. Part of the fun was watching the comments, was watching people that you could never do during a live show. And you really, I agree, I think you're really finding, you are finding that connection, uh, especially now when we really do need it. 
Um, is there anything else you guys feel in, in terms that you kind of want to shout out to the non-believers uh, in terms of the streaming? I mean, we'll talk about some of the other benefits, but in, in general, I think everybody here is agreement that this is theater. Um, would you say there's a difference between live theater, like it needs to be live versus showing an archive? Like, have you guys, do you draw the line there with any? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, there were pre-recorded segments of Clue, and I can talk a bit more about that. But I mean, just going back even to Ernest and Peter's experience with like dropping a gun or dropping a prop or actually taking advantage of the livingness of a mistake in a live space, we had that exact same thing happen in Ernest. If you can imagine eight different actors having to hand props off screen, off camera to each other, at one point, our one of our actors had forgotten he had a wine glass in the dishwasher, so he just handed off the entire bottle, of, and someone came back with a glass of sherry. That's <laughs> the comedy that is improvised and is so authentic to yeah. a living performance. That is what you've got to love about this. Exactly. You discover these parts about the medium as you go ahead and create the work there, which is why I'm so against the idea of shunning it before we even have a chance to experiment with it. I agree. It's all about experimenting. And as Peter said, part of the humor and fun is that this is new to everyone. We're forgivable for it. It's like improv. Like we're, we're, we, we allow certain things because we're all kind of just making it up as we go along. Um, so wonderful. Well, let's, let's but move on. Oh, please. That on that, and I think Andrew will also agree with this. Like we, I'm sure you did this, Andrew. Like we approached this like a real show. We, we had rehearsals, we had previews, we brought people in, we tinkered, we, you know, we got new speakers, we got new lights. Like we did everything we could to make it professional starting on time, you know, making the link easy to find, just like a theater, like make, like have the directions on the postcards so you can find the theater. Um, you know, as people, I mean, I don't think Andrew and I probably realized when we were doing it that we were, you know, pioneers or vanguards in any way. Uh, but after a few weeks, I kind of went, well, you know, if this is gonna be the thing and mm -hmm. people are just learning about this thing now, and, w and watching it, it kind of has to be good now. Otherwise they'll be like, yeah, I tried that online theater thing. It's a mess, I'm not coming back. You know, um, Yeah. it takes a lot more, it takes, just like theater, it's not supposed to look like it took a lot of work. Absolutely, it has to be kind of effortless in how it feels. I mean, we learned so much by iterating on it too. I mean, if you give me a chance to talk a bit more about Clue, I can mention that that's the latest thing we worked on with Pixel Playhouse. I've got at least the logo just popped up if we can share the screen for a second. Absolutely. But this yeah. is very tongue in cheek, very in the vein of what is the Twitch audience looking for? And we broadcast on twitch.tv, which is a platform largely for people who are more useful and typically follow video game content or very light, fluffy content of people live streaming. So we produced a parody musical version of Clue called Definitely Not Clue because we're not associated with the board game. But it was an interactive musical mystery where we, would, we went ahead and built home studios with lighting and green screens for our talents. So you can see a microphone here in frame as well. And it led to a production like this where we started to go, okay, how can we take what looks like a Zoom call, take what looks like actually facing towards camera interaction, and then lay on VFX and overlays to a live performance to make a Zoom better than Zoom. The same way we, when we take real life and stage it, we make real life bigger than real life and make it naturalistic and not realistic. That's what we were trying to create in terms of a style of a comedic presentation here. You'll never see a Zoom call that looks like this, but there are enough of the inclination, in, indicators of a Zoom call to know that that's implicitly where we are. It's the idea of design being that, hey, we're implicitly in a Zoom call, but we can actually customize the size of our framing. We can give them custom backgrounds so that, for instance, our Ruby Rose character in the back left, uh, in the top left, has a vanity mirror because she was an actress in high school. And there's little touches about the backgrounds that can tell us about the characters. That's all about design being translated into a virtual medium now. And at least here's our world in the clue with our Mr. Body character. But talking to the comedy of this, at least of the interactivity, here's an image of Mr. Body interacting with our chat. And we had a multi-branching narrative of who did it each time change in the same way I expect the villain of Clue or the murder of Clue to change with every board game. And in our final night, we had gotten so into the narratives that our chat, our audience had crafted of who might be the actual villain, that we made this little fake character, Mr. Mittens, the, the tiny toy cat in his hand, the secret uh, the secret killer in this version. And so the actual narrative and the writing of the piece and the acting of the piece responded organically to how it was presented live over the course of its two week run. That is great. And, and you see the chat going off on the side where people were just jumping in. Oh yes, this is going by like crazy over the course of about 20 seconds, this many messages came in for our audience of around 300 at the time, which is larger, uh, is a larger concurrent audience than anything I've done in Intimate Theater before now because Intimate Theater is limited to 99 seats. So concurrently, we tripled my typical uh, audience. 
Yeah, what were your numbers? What was what was your kind of normal show for this? We landed between 250 to 350 for most nights. We had wow. a minimal fall off of around 50 people where we'd start around 350, then end around 300 or so across about six performances. Wow, that's amazing. All right. And um, actually, since you've got it up, and I don't know if you have a separate presentation, um, but or we can cut over to Peter, come back, whatever you're comfortable with. Do you want to talk a little bit about the OBS platform? I mean, this is such the advanced level of it, but to give people kind of an, an idea of, of, of some of what it took to get to this kind of level. Of course, yeah. We're just going to skip past some other slides that uh, are, well, that's a fun one, we'll get to another time. Let me jump forward to, away from my professional work, into what OBS looks like, and that's the idea that we're all used to the Zoom framework of it being the Brady Bunch, and we're all kind of sick of looking at the Brady Bunch framing. But we have at least this limiting factor of it, people in their individual feeds of rectangular boxes on a screen. So how do we choreograph where those boxes go? And as we move forward in the medium, how do we get away from the idea that people need to actually be isolated in the boxes? And so a lot of what I work in is a platform called Open Broadcast Software. And I try and find ways to get video feeds out of Zoom. And so, for instance, here's an example of a piece of a website I use called OBS Ninja that lets people be on a Zoom call, be used to the interaction that we use of talking to one another through Zoom. And then they can also simultaneously simulcast their video and audio to me in a much higher quality than what Zoom is. Zoom audio and Zoom video is honestly pretty terrible for broadcast quality. But I can go ahead and scrape the website this pulls their feeds to and create something that looks like Clue, which is a much higher quality video feed that allows us to go ahead and lay in things like these VFX secondary elements of the cards you might use to accuse someone when your audience is trying to guess who did it in a given evening. That looks something like this when you look at the breakdown of how things were when we did uh, the importance of being earnest. Just like you might look at a cue list for lighting or a cue list for sound effects or, or video programming, we have cues numbered 50, 51, 51.5 with layouts of where people are on the screen as we start to choreograph and storyboard where are their audio and video feeds, where do we look at them, what are their relationships to one another as they interact with one another. What was very exciting about uh, this project, and you'll have to forgive me as I jump back a ways back to where it was in this slideshow, is that we actually staged them with eye lines off camera. So even if they were in different rooms, we tried to break down the idea of them actually being in disparate spaces by having them look off, off camera to where someone else was based off where they were staged at a given point. So their apartments were full of spike tape on the walls as they tried to go ahead and recreate the physicality of being in the same environment through a digital medium. That's amazing. I, I love seeing these and, and seeing the challenges that you guys have conquered in terms of performing on this. Um, now, looking at this, I'm sure for a lot of our viewers too, it looks very complicated, a far bigger jump from Zoom and people that even, you know, my parents are now on Zoom and, and do go through that. Um, are there, I, I know YouTube videos, things out there. What do you recommend for a performer uh, who may want to kind of up their game in terms of, of, of learning OBS um, and or are there people like yourself out there that can be hired to kind of put these things together? Absolutely. I mean, I started writing a few articles addressed towards more towards performers who have no technical skill set on how to build their own home studios, how to go ahead and start breaking down how to work in OBS. And there's also a variety of people like me who work in this professionally. I work not just for people working in theater. I also have corporate clients where we go ahead and actually build studio grade setups like this to go ahead and do remote productions or remote performances for random materials. And I work with a variety of folks who are more than happy to go ahead and work in theater as well. A lot of us came up through theater and then pivoted into this as the new way to use design. But I also think that there's a, a potential out there for a lot more people who are who, who are or were formerly designers to go ahead and learn how to use the same skills that I did. I taught myself over the course of the first month of quarantine. I was a light designer before this. I had never used OBS in the past. Instead, I decided, started looking at the challenges ahead of me. How do I make this one show happen and address them piece by piece as we try to solve them together as a production team? Yeah, that is, you bring up an interesting point, and, and I think it's going to be a, a future episode on what's next, is this designer pivot. The number of stage managers I know who are now Zoom stage managers. It's just that's what they're doing. And likewise for designers, and I think, you know, video designers in particular um, kind of can pivot very easily into this. Um, I'd like to bring up, and I'll bring it up later, um, your website uh, where you have the article um, 
uh, some several nice articles about the process. Um, and then people could also get in touch with you uh, for questions and or, you know, maybe you have some people to, to forward uh, to help with it because it is amazing what you're doing. And I do think it really breaks the kind of Zoom theater that everybody's talking about um, and, and really kind of uh, uh, challenges that. Um, is there any other slides, anything you want to show uh, re related to the OBS uh, in terms of the actual technical kind of do it, doing it side? To some extent, yeah, let me go ahead and pop down a bit later to uh, what's most exciting to be right now is how do we go ahead and actually get the visceral feedback of working how do you get a visual feedback of actually working with performers and getting the feedback for uh, performers seeing an eyes member responding to it mm -hmm. or seeing production designers responding to it? And one of the things that I've been most excited about is why I'm in black and white right now. You can go ahead and take production design and put it back into the Zoom call where your performers are. They can see yeah. how they've been manipulated with digital content to actually be in that environment. And in this case, it's really funny. It's actually just my friend is doing a folklore, Taylor Swift folklore themed happy hour. But you can see what can happen if people just want to go ahead and take a dumb challenge and apply some technical expertise to it or apply some how about Grace to learn how to do it? Here's at least a way to go ahead and pipe in some post-production and some color correction into a Zoom call. So the performer might be able to see, oh, this is the background I'm in front of. I can understand now where I'm performing in space and time, even though I'm just in front of a green screen. What's very exciting to me is even the idea of merging virtual spaces, of getting away from rectangles and of individual feeds, and actually going, okay, what happens if we green screen people out and put them into the same virtual space? And then have take the acting techniques we use from Ernest and have them act off camera to each other so that we can take them physically distant, physically safe and remote from one another, but virtually in the same performance space. That's, I think, the next step for everything. Yeah, that's That's kind of like a 2D virtual reality room. Absolutely, right. and you can also start to work with depth of field with foreground elements and background elements, and then you have a third person crossing behind people who's a smaller scale as well as you start to work with human scale as well on top of that. There's so many fun ways that this is gonna go ahead and develop and expand over the next few months, and I'm just real proud to be part of that as we start to innovate on it now. It's it's very exciting, and but and and also just in terms of, you know, your average kind of artist out there, um, I know OBS is free. Like you can download OBS as long as you've got a Mac or PC with enough uh, processing power and all that. How about some of this other like post production programming, especially the you know rear screen, like the rear screen kind of virtual uh, green screen, but also I've seen some of your work where you are affecting the foreground of, of the images. Of course, I mean, and these all came out of me learning this technology from April until May, right around uh, June or so, I started being hired by corporate clients to go ahead and do the same thing. I was brought on to products with a group called Little Cinema who do uh, theatrical experiences for branded content and started building home studios for them in the same sort of way that we saw for Clue. And so here's a studio grade setup that we built for the, the premiere of Legendary for HBO Max. We can see we've got studio quality sound, lighting, video, and it seems like it's a lot to deal with. But at the same time, the software side is the exact same thing that I'm using for Ernest, for Clue, for anything else I work on That's in the amazing. meantime. And I learned it all by learning it for theater. And now it's actually been my pivot into how I make a living in the middle of COVID. You can see some of how that looks in the production design right here, where we have a platform that looks very similar to Twitch. This is uh, the activation for TNT as the Alienist a few weeks ago. And you can see a mix of live actual live actor talking to people in the middle of a murder mystery. The, the audience in chat over here is trying to solve who did it for a murder in the style, same style detective series, The Alienist. And let's try and break down what's actually real and what's fake in this composition. The background here, Delmonico's in New York in the turn of the century, is all a green screen. At least the foreground, this bar is real, he's real. But if you look even closer to the foreground, this brown bar surface, we had no physical bar in this space. He's got a folding table with a black tablecloth. And we were able to lay in a digital bar in front of him to make him seem like he's in the same world as the background. There was a little bit of warm light on his right side and cool light on his left side, which is really how I got my pivot into this by being able to light four green screens and match digital content that makes him look like he's authentically part of this virtual environment. Yeah. And on top of that, we also have additional elements that help clue in our audience into what should happen. They've got a sidebar that tells them how to interact with this character as they talk to him through chat. He's got a monitor in front of him so we can see the chat and authentically respond to their questions and interact with them as a character. We've got a countdown to let them know how long while they go through our, we've got a carousel on the bottom of different rooms to go to, so the countdown lets them know how long until the end of this act, plus a clue overlay of what clues have been solved so far. As you can see, a great meshing of what we were already starting to do with mediatization and live theater with projection design and LED screens in live theater happening in a digital environment now. It's the same thing we were already doing in, in, in actual live theater, just through a digital platform. That's amazing. And all of this, 
Andrew, you may have said this. Is this all OBS? This is all OBS. OBS is playing everything back. And 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 including like the bar, because I always thought that was cool. Like you're affecting the image in front of the actor. Is that also OBS or is that? That's a, also OBS. That's just a foreground element in OBS. So basically, this and I've I've got the links. I'll for everyone. I will put this in the comments once we're done. Um, all of this is free, and it's just taking some time. Maybe going through YouTube. They've got a lot of videos, and and kind of knocking it out, and and maybe employ some of your friends who are. Uh, theater stage managers, designers uh, to pick up and make this happen. Of course. It's training yourself, right? Absolutely. I, I think that it's all you can learn yourself, but I'm also very interested in learning how Peter's worked with Zoom on this because I've been so reticent to use Zoom as a platform. I've been so intrigued to hear about what he's doing. Yeah, let's talk. So this is a great shift. Thank you uh, for all that, Andrew. So um, on the other side of the scale is in terms of tech, is is zoom and like i said i mean most of the country's using zoom um and i remember peter back when you had a lot of comments out there kind of looking around and looking at different platforms um really asking kind of what's best and there were so many new ones i mean here's Streamyard. this this is another platform uh that's really good for talk shows it has some you know, nice banners and, and information I can bring up and branding. Um, but you ended up deciding on Zoom and, but there was a, it wasn't just ease of use. There was really specific reasons. And if you can kind of talk about that and also describe using it in the broader sense of doing the technology from an apartment in New York City um, and kind of your setup with that. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was a process. Um, I mean, for Desperately Seeking the Exit, it's a comedy. I had to hear the audience respond. That was my first thing. Yeah. And it became about, oh, the audience can see each other, so that's very theatrical. I like that. Um, yeah, I think the first couple of shows, the sound wasn't great. The screen share wasn't great. Actually, like, we watched Zoom make improvements <laughs> about, you know, yeah. now you can enhance your video, your, your screen share and stuff. Um, you know, trying out the right microphone, learning that you can't have all your Bluetooths on in your house at the same time because it can't find where to go. And then you know, if you're using a, a Bluetooth speaker while you're using a Bluetooth here, you can't, it's no. <laughs> um, I think for like the, yeah, so in Exit, I play samples of Blondie's music and go, oh, that can be this in the show. Oh, that could be this. Learn very early on, I can just, so in this real show, I'm playing it and talking over it, building excitement. In this one, I play a little bit, but I have to stop because otherwise it will cut out. Weirdly, in the kids' show, which we tried many different uh, sound options, microphone, I mean, the whole, I mean, everything but buying a mixer, which I'm, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> um, we learned that weirdly that like if I had the a music stand, at the level where the computer is and the speaker is up top on the music stand, so the sound is literally going in, hmm. I sing and play at the same time because I'm basically in the same place. So I'm not, a, I don't know any about, <laughs> I'm not technical, <laughs> but I learned it and I, and, and like no complaints ever, including my monitor, who's always the first to go, eh, that's not really... So yeah, that was just a, uh, that was really hard. Um, the kid show was especially hard because, like I said, the kid show was is is so interactive in the real theater where children are coming on stage, changing scenery, picking out costumes, picking out props. It's mm -hmm. constant the whole show. It couldn't do that for this, um, so I had to think of another way. And um, I have it here. Yeah, the the way was to have all the kids write down their name and their city, so that when they had a suggestion. Mm -hmm. up. And that was practical for me, but what it became was kids are watching a show with kids from all over the place. Yeah. I mean, at one point we had like Canada and China and Florida, all the same show. You know, I think that's a really exciting thing for a kid that they would so, never ever have in any other experience. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I make sure they're all introduced. The bad side of it is I can only do the show for 20 kids at a time. I, see. I can't possibly call on all of them anything more than 20. So that means I'm not making as much money. Uh, so I have to do more shows, which is exhausting. This mm -hmm. this whole thing, I mean, I've been doing it all night out of just habit of looking at this little green dot. Um, 
I actually brought my computer and I realized they really did change even the screen. Um, Cause there was a little round circle that told me where to look. So I'm not looking at the dot, I'm looking slightly off the dot. Hmm. But, and just learning to like trust that I don't have to look at myself. So I turn off my own image. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm focusing right here. Out of my peripheral vision, I can see people reacting in some way uh, or holding up their stuff. Also for the kids show, I play a character who has no idea how to use a computer. So if anything, <laughs> it's perfect, it makes perfect sense. You know, the, the idea is that I'm brought, I, I'm helping my friend, my roommate put on a show and then she's not here. And that's done through me going, okay, it's time to come on. And then on the speaker, we have her voice going, I can't do it. Like, oh well, no, come on, come on. No, I can't until time. The door slamming, you hear her go. It's just ridiculous. <laughs> but it's kind of like what we did, what I did when I was a kid putting on a show. You're just like, oh, if I use thread, I can make something fly. You know, oh, this spatula looks like a bat, you know, whatever. Uh, just being ridiculously creative, um, you know, turning. Should I just like show you this? Yeah, show us. That would be great. I don't know how much room. So this is one of the things I would suggest to everybody is like hard wire. You can't go wrong if you're hard wiring your computer. If you're using Wi-Fi, look, we always know when it's the performer's Wi-Fi that's going out. <laughs> so I want my money back if you're zip zapping in and out. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, this isn't going to work very well, but uh, right. So yeah, so I basically hung this curtain just with Velcro and staples on the ceiling. Then I've got this prop box up here. Uh, this, this box is filled with toilet paper rolls that all come dumping down on me at the end. I'm not joking. That took a week to figure out. <laughs> I have the uh, screen share for that. Should I just show that? Oh, let's see that. Let's see that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm a big fan of uh, Austin Kleon's work, um, uh, Show Your Work, where you keep the audience engaged in your process, which, as you know, Matt, from the very beginning, what time do kids like to watch shows? You know, I, I just love to bring them all into it. So yeah. I was trying this bit out every day, determined to make it work by the time the show opened. <laughs> and uh, this is the one where it actually worked. And I swear to you, everything you're seeing is 100% authentic. <laughs> Costume change. Okay, I really think I have this one figured out. So this is gonna be the one, and by the way, I have not tried any of these out without first putting them on film, camera, zeros and ones, digital platforms. This is my tribute to Captain Kangaroo. If you don't live in America, Google Captain Kangaroo and ping pong balls. And I'm going to do it in my show, show up kids online very soon. So without any further ado, as I, <laughs> as I reach for the cord off screen, this is what we are trying to make happen. I'm on my spike mark and boy, wouldn't it be great if it worked? <laughs> <laughs> that That's great. Good. But, uh, yeah. I don't know how to build a box that drops out paper towels. Yeah. I mean, it was just like trying things out and like going online and going, I can't get, and someone's like, oh, you need to put a little bumper at the end so that they side so that they don't fall off this. It's just crazy. But, you know, I talk about it, spike marks. Yeah, I had to get a spike. It's just like real theater. There's a spike mark. The lights go in the right place every time. It's it's That's exactly it. Um, so, yeah, these are just curtains that I got from Materials for the Arts that are normally used in the show. This is like, you know, normally my office. Um, but uh, uh, over here is just like set up like uh, places to for props. I cannot figure out. Yeah, just tons of props and stuff. This the whole set. The board is here that I'm controlling. Uh, there's a box of crazy flakes because that's a big part of the show. Um, yeah, I, th I thought I had a point for all this, but I, I really don't know what it is. Well, if I I could jump in with that, I, I I think what I'm finding so wonderful that you're illustrating the imagination of this. This is new. You are coming up the signs. Like how great, how simple of an answer to get people to connect. 
that you really are forced to kind of build like old kind of vaudeville jokes and things and stuff to kind of have fun in this new medium. It's actually going back to some of the older theater well, elements. I'm not, a, I'm not a film television person. Like I've really never done any film or television. So this business of looking at the camera is really new. I mean, I can't even slate at a commercial audition. I'm so <laughs> terrified of that camera. I'm going to be great the next time I go in for a Coke commercial. But um, yeah, someone was someone watched a little bit that I did today at, at something, and they were like, oh, I love how you're using the depth of field. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's right, because when I do this, it looks hilarious. Yeah, that's great. It's, it's, it's true. Funny. I got a whole bit in the show where I do a staring contest. <laughs> that's all I have to do. And actually, right before this, I was practicing something, and I thought of a whole new bit where I where I get really close. Oh, sorry, you know, like, <laughs> just, like just, just be a 100% authentic yeah. about your situation. It's uh, great. And, and I love both you guys have such a ring. We got some high tech, you know, programming that allows certain effects that you couldn't do. And then just, you know, the innocence of a new toy and somebody playing with the camera and all that. I, my nephew does that during Zoom talks and it's hysterical and it's real. It's very real. Can I just back uh, up a second for Andrew asked about not, you know, not no the, the whole Zoom thing. I do not recommend using Zoom unless you absolutely have to have the audience verbally, audio in an audio audio way or a visual way, uh, interact with the show. Uh, there's no other reason to use it. I don't think, other than to like create something. But if you're doing something live, if you don't need to hear the audience, if you don't need to see the audience, don't use Zoom. I've been so curious about that. I mean, it sounds like you've got such a great way to actually get engagement with these children and with your audience in general. That's the exact reason to use Zoom. And every time I see a, a reading on a Zoom, for instance, from someone in the theater actual community, I'm like, but why would you do that when you can curate your performance somewhere else? Like, you don't invite your audience on stage unless you want them on stage. And if Zoom is your stage, then you're stuck with them there. Yeah. So I, I love the intentionality of your work. I think that's the best way to use it. But mm -hmm. also, like, how do your audiences know that your stuff is live? We have interactive elements where they, what they say in chat, we respond to. Right. Uh, there's plenty of mistakes all the time. And even though Clue was an intermix of pre recorded and live segments, like we still haven't cracked the bug of how to go ahead and do multiple live performers singing a musical number. So we recorded those numbers over the course of a weekend, but we taught ourselves how to go ahead and record things remotely too. But beyond that, it's all live and the mistakes happen. There's different acting every time. We encourage a lot of ad libbing in response to what might be happening on the day of, for instance. Yeah. So it's just a different experience each time is what we're trying to go for. So why would you watch a Twitch show multiple times? If it's live, that's the only reason to. You can't watch a recording multiple times in a weekend. I think even when people have something that's on video, just introduce it. <laughs> hey, it's Thursday. It's 8 o'clock. Thank you mm -hmm. for being here. Here's the show. I'll be around afterwards if you want to talk. I think that that, that that doesn't feel like autopilot, like we just went to a movie theater and someone hit go on the projector. and Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and something actually that kind of – that you, 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 well, actually, let me start with this, Andrew. So we've got kind of the extreme from Zoom to OBS. Would you recommend for anybody out there other platform? Like I mentioned StreamYard, uh, and I'm working on an improv show, Tilted Frame, where we're using StreamYard because, as you know from Zoom, the square layout that we have changes for everybody's screen. And so it's very hard. Like Peter and I could do a little bit where we're playing with each other. It's reverse. So they, hey, Peter, how are you? And, and we can play that. And with improv, you see a lot of these improv shows and they can't. Um, is it OBS or Zoom or StreamYard? Is there any other platforms either of you have kind of come across that you could shout out that people could look at? No. <laughs> <laughs> These are the three, OBS and StreamYard. The three, I mean, there is a more intuitive version of OBS. Like I use OBS Studio, which looks very intimidating. OBS Streamlabs is a lot less intimidating to look at, but it's fundamentally the same practical applications. It's just if you like the graphic interface even more or not. I found there's more, you can do more complex things with Studio, so I worked in that and I, I left into that to begin with. Yeah, okay. I got, I got a corporate gig for the kids show for a company that normally they all go bowling or they have a picnic. <laughs> And they're based in the UK and in New York. Uh, and um, they were like, we, we use blue jeans. We use blue jeans. We use blue oh, jeans. Oh, yeah. So we like had it, which is very much, very much like um, Zoom. So we had a little technical rehearsal. So my monitor, everyone get a monitor. <laughs> they will get rid of those bombers. They will get rid of the person eating potato chips. They will, you know, it's just a stage manager. You need that. Um, uh, we start the rehearsal, and it's just such a different beast. 
I basically said, you know what? The kids don't know how to use this now. Like only corporate people know how to use blue jeans. Kids know how to use Zoom. Can we just please use Zoom? And so that's what we wound up using. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, kids, even for adults, I'm not gonna bring in a whole new, at this, I can't. I, I, yeah. We've gotten them trained now. You know, I don't know about you, but in the beginning, there was a whole speech before the show started about, here's how this works. We're gonna do this and this, you know, and you'd, you'd see this whole thing happening constantly, right? Doesn't really, everyone kind of knows what to do now, I think. Yeah. And, and I've also heard, and this may just be through the rumor mill that like you kind of alluded to, Peter, um, these technologies are changing. These companies are realizing how they're being used and that Zoom was going to come out with a version with a static cells that you could everything would be the same for everyone so i can only imagine as we're longer in this that more of the technology will gear itself to these kind of performances um all right so we got a few there peter you brought up and uh i'd be curious i know andrew you have a whole process but the the idea of monitors the idea of your team this is not just you i've got a monitor monitoring our chat room uh, one of the lessons I learned from Peter was have the tech rehearsals before, have the team, I mean, old school theater, really, have your tech run through, uh, have monitors. Andrew, I know you do extensive running around, making sure everybody has Ethernet, all that. Can you talk a little bit about that for people who are looking to do a show? Uh, Peter, do you want to leave it or should I take it away? Go for it. Of course, of course. Uh, so we do a whole onboarding process because our setups are so complex. We've got Bluetooth earbuds, we've got microphones, lighting and green screens. And so there's a lot of what we have to do to make people comfortable with bringing all this technology into their homes when they're typical performers who have not had to deal with that technology is really just establishing trust in me and in the fact that we'll have a team that's going to support them to do their best work. And so it's individual meetings for about 15, 20 minutes with each of them talking them through, here's what's gonna happen for your home, here's how we're gonna build it, we can walk you through how to do it, or we're gonna have someone come by who's been COVID tested to help walk you through it, and then they'll leave and they'll have this up in your home to work do it as you will. And then from that point on, it's all about giving them a chance to learn about it and to work with it before they have to worry about being an actor. It's about making them comfortable in this new environment where technology is so omnipresent. Mm -hmm. And then we also, of course, have a monitor on chat, moderators there to both guide interactions for our chats to facilitate positive interactions between people in the chat, our audiences, as well as towards the actors, as well as to teach people how to go and understand what this material is. So because we're on Twitch, people don't necessarily start at the beginning of the show. They might jump in an hour in or two hours in. And so there's a lot of onboarding happening through chat when the people sort of hop on in the middle of the show. We also, of course, in the broadcast, have a whole team of sound designer, a stage manager or person who's playing back the cues, as well as our typically a live piano accompanist who's actually playing live on their end to underscore the entire piece. So, okay. I want to stop for a second because you're annoying the fuck out of me. <laughs> I'm thinking I'm the person, I am that person, and I'm going, how do you afford this? I mean, I watched, the, I watched one of these shows that was set in a closet in outer space, and the thing was turning and everything. It was, like, amazing. Then I read about it, and then they had a $6,000 budget. I think most people doing this or maybe even watching this right now have, like, a $60 budget. So how can all of these people be involved? And yeah, how does everyone, I don't know, how does that work? It works because we were already part of a Twitch. And so we already have a way to monetize through people who subscribe to our channel. I also don't take a fee myself because I get money by working with corporate clients. And right now we're in the middle of COVID. So my thoughts are let's give back to everyone as much as we can and get everyone to a level where we can produce this kind of work. Yeah. But yeah, if, I'm I'm not the only one to not take a fee, but we do make sure to pay our, pay our actors and to go and pay our technicians. And that comes through both the fact that we are fortunate enough to be partnered with Twitch and have some monetization that way. Yeah, that's, that's great. That's, great. Uh, that's reassuring. <laughs> I, I'm not sure everybody has that uh, um, luxury. Uh, of course. So like, it's, it's such a tough call to think like, how do I, how do I monetize this thing? And right off the bat, I just made people buy tickets because it's like a theater show. You got to buy a ticket. Mm -hmm. I think it also makes it exciting to get the link an hour before and all that stuff and offer discounts and all that. Uh, even the ticketing site that I use, Event Combo, completely learned how to do this and how to time emails to go out an hour before, which never what you'd never have to do that for a real show. Um, and I think that's a thing a lot of artists are struggling with is like, ah, I shouldn't be charging for this. I think if you're rehearsing and collaborating and doing all the things you do for a real show, you should charge for it. Mm. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Because I, I agree there's been articles 
that said theater is falling down the rabbit hole of newspapers. That newspapers went online and they gave it all away for free and then it became very tough to come back from that. Um, do you mind talking a little bit about and both of you? We can start with Peter uh, because you did it the old fashioned ticket way. How that kind of worked for you uh, with the limit? Some of your show had an audience limit, but some of it, your yeah, other show I, didn't. I mean, Exit had a limit of 80 because I was thinking big and I'd had 80 for the oh. first. My chart is this March, beginning of April, 80 people per show. April, 60. End of April, 50. May 40, end of uh, April, May, June. Yeah, I stopped by the end of May because it got down to 35 people. In that time, I got nine reviews, a piece in the Washington Post, a piece of, uh, mentioned in the New York Times, uh, uh, you know, more followers than I ever had, the medium piece, uh, the list goes on and on. I was getting tons of publicity, but my audiences were getting smaller. Mm -hmm. and. I never took it personally. I I realized that I also was tired of watching people shows online, yeah. and I'd rather just watch the video, uh, watch a video of somebody's show as a favor, uh, or if I watch something live, I put myself on so you can't see me. Um, so that's why I stopped, um, especially for the kids because they're on Zoom all day long at school. So when mom and dad say, "Hey, you want to watch a Zoom show?" they're like, "No." <laughs> well, um, yeah, so uh, I'm just starting to bring the kids show back because I think uh, I think they're now so used to it that they know that there's other things out there on Zoom. But um, yeah, I was making great money and then it just I watched it just get less. I was doing more and more work and getting less money back. And, and you're able to do the show and make money without a, all the overhead. You didn't have to rent a theater. No. You didn't have all these costs that would normally be associated. Yeah, with just the show. monitor. My yeah. monitor great. <laughs> she did really yeah. well for herself. So you went into some other interesting elements and let's open it up. And Andrew, I'd love to get your thought. It, it, not only in terms of the, the monetizing of this, uh, and I know you've got a, a different realm of that, but then also there's the, the benefit of this that isn't money. That is you know, the Wall Street Journal who would never see your show normally could come see it. Audience like from Japan and Australia coming actors. Like I've heard directors talk about, I got actors from all over. Can you talk to some of that that you've seen? Absolutely. So typically I'm working on bicycle Productions. For our earnest, we had an actress in New York as well as actors and actresses all over Los Angeles able to come together to rehearse together and to perform in a way that is not possible with geographically centric performances. Even just the original production of what Pixel Playhouse was, a broadcasting a cabaret of Los Angeles performers to anyone around the world, built up an audience of people in Singapore, in Malaysia, in the Netherlands, who are regularly watching our content on a weekly basis. And I think that there's something to be gained by realizing that, okay, the challenge of actual physical theater is that your audiences are geographically limited to people who are A, interested in your work, and B, have the money and the agency to go ahead and take a Friday off to go drive out and see your show which is honestly not the most inclusive way to create an art form. Whereas if it's free and available on Twitch and we can monetize by people who want to donate to us or if we can monetize through sponsorships or corporate partnerships, it means we're way more inclusive and way more accessible to people around the world who can see what our artists are capable of doing. I think that's something great to be said for at least this medium of how we, perform, how we create the work, of course. Absolutely, and I've heard people do pretty well with the virtual donations. Um, and then the corporate, do you, do you have any, um, of course, typically our clients for the corporate shows are people from the Warner Media world. So TNT, CBS, any of the ones. Typically, what we work on are the after parties for premieres of television, television shows, mm -hmm. which used to be red carpet gala events, and now there we ship a cocktail kit and other sort of swag box things to celebrities. They open them up and get a physical idea of what the world is. So they'll sort of venture into digitally, and then the monetization is largely because this is already marketing output. It was already spent a sunk cost from TNT or what have you, and so there's not a need to ticket for our audiences. Our audiences are really just there to go ahead and elevate the brand of whoever we're working with. Mm -hmm. At the same time, The Alienist had a public event, a public preview of the work of that murder mystery because we were just so proud to create a theatrical narrative that you could bounce between different rooms the same way you might a sleep no more experience to solve a interactive murder mystery. That was something we released for free in conjunction with Warner Media. And, and it's so Twitch, the people who are kind of advertisers on Twitch and all that, they're, you're getting a kickback basically from Twitch, kind of like how YouTube does it. 
To an extent, yes. It's, there, people can subscribe to your channel and then pay something like $5 a month, which you can then split that cost with Twitch. You can also go ahead and reach a point where you can run ads as pre-roll on your content to get money, money back from Twitch. Or you can start to work with corporate sponsors and maybe you do a promoted stream in conjunction with, I don't know, Westinghouse TVs or something. Yeah, that's what you need, Peter. Okay. You need that sponsor. Let's find you a sponsor. Um, I, I also hear pa Patreon. Patreon, people are using that and they're kind of like, pay to like a subscription model. The same way that the luxury of actually the luxury of social capital to actually go into a live event like Coachella warrants you to be able to spend more money. I'm sure you can go do like tiered subscriptions to Patreon to get more access to your performers and people are willing to spend that money. But that doesn't mean you can go, you don't need to release your content to other people who can't spend that money too. That's, that's our thought at least. I, I hear the word tier a lot. Everything's tiered. So you've got your $20 ticket, the $10 ticket and the free ticket. And now that you've got this huge mass audience, it kind of works out. It's like a pay what you can. Yeah, that's, I think that's a model that works for quite a few creators out there. Some of the fringe festivals are doing that. You just pay one price, and then you have access to all the stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, before I move on to some of the other questions and some of the questions out there, are there any other tech tips, moderators, things that you as pioneers and vanguarders can kind of share vanguarders kind of share with uh your viewing public about launching into this i've got a show i want to make this happen any other secret tips collaborate just find someone that you trust who's going to sit there and watch your stuff um like i'm doing my kids show for just adults tomorrow night as a mm -hmm. as a little brush up rehearsal um because uh, because i have a critic <laughs> watching it <laughs> what the hell like how did how is the critic from the scotsman watching my show wow it's amazing <laughs> it doesn't make sense um yeah yeah and just like take the time to to do all that i mean when i do exit in the other room I, it sounds like i live in a mansion it's just this room and that room uh i spend a good half hour before the show like moving that little piece so it's not distracting and moving that book because I don't, it has boobs on it or whatever. I don't have any books with boobs on it, but uh, you know what I'm saying? Like just being careful about all that stuff. Um, you know, it's, I have a stage manager friend who does Broadway shows who lives right upstairs. And early on in this, I was like, oh, so every day, you know, every day I'm doing the show, I'm so stressed having to like, where's the, you know, elevate the camera so it's eye level and what's underneath the thing and how can you grab this and where are the lights? And she's like, so you're putting down brown paper, right? I said, no, that's how you do it in the theater, right? You put brown paper on the table, you draw everything where it goes, and that thing is sitting in, I use it every single time. I just lay it out and I go, right, this here, this here, then you never miss anything. Um, so it's just treat this like a real show. That's all I can say. That's a great note. Treat it like a real show because it is one. Um, Andrew, with all of this technology, how somebody who's like, God, I really like that OBS. I want, you mentioned the easier version. What would you recommend for someone who wants to get into this? I think Peter's totally right. Collaborate with someone. Find a small project where you can go ahead and address some small challenges together and then incrementally build on your experience. I learn best by going, okay, I want to try and create that. I don't know how to do it, but I'm going to take an hour to try different ways to get to that point. And you learn by iterating and making mistakes and failing until you get to something you've enjoyed working on. And it's a lot of it goes back to things that we learn in the theater, just like, but just like Peter said, spiking things out on the floor, easy solutions. Being aware of your environment is the hugest thing. Like I recall there was a Stephen Sondheim stream where someone gave a beautiful performance, but there was a book on Irish erotic art, right at eye line, right next to her head. And the entire chat's going by Irish erotic art all in caps going, <laughs> okay, they've clearly divorced themselves from your performance because of not being aware and curating your environment. I think there's a lot to be said for the kind of care that Peter and takes into the work that we do. <laughs> That's great. I saw walk by somebody's uh, live show this morning. That was amazing. Oh, goodness. <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey, I was like, please keep the cat. Uh, I'm just looking at, so there's a lot of questions here. There's yeah, let's, I'm going to thank you. Yeah, I was going to go out and I'm going to start with actually a good friend of both Peter and I. Uh, I'm going to bring these questions on board uh, and let's let's just call it out. We kind of went through this, but, you know, let's talk about Monica. Monica Martin. Hello, Monica Martin. Um is OBS expensive? It is totally free. You just search for OBS on Google and download it and start playing. That's great. Well, and I will uh, I will be posting all of these links, any helpful links. If you guys have anything you think will be helpful, send it in to me um, just to kind of uh, share this information. Uh, that's great. It's free. All right, let's go to another one here. 
So do all actors need their green screen? And the kind of, you know, I guess this is kind of to you, Andrew, when you were dealing with all those different people. No, I mean, look at Peter's setup. I think what you need to be is aware of your environment and curate that environment the same way you might design a set for a theater. We're, not, we're creating theater online here. So the same way you want to bring in lights, bring in costumes, bring in props, bring in scenery. Think about what you want to create with the story you're telling. What are the what's the what are the challenges and obstacles you need to overcome to tell the story you want to tell? And if the solution to that obstacle is digital backgrounds, then yes, it's a green screen. If it's a physical background you can create, then it's a physical background, and it doesn't need to be something that costs a ton of money. Yeah. And again, it's the plane with it. It's experimenting, getting crafty, creative. Um, and then this is Pam Knowles, who I know is a very crafty, creative person. Uh, and in fact, she's got a bunch of questions. They're so going to call up another one. <laughs> Uh, Pam asks, thoughts on writing works specifically to play to strengths and weaknesses of various streaming platforms? I got something for that. I can't tell you how many uh, submission things I'm seeing nowadays for stuff that was specifically created for this. Uh, I watched a great production called uh, Are, Are you, You're Hamlet. Are You Hamlet? Sorry if you're watching, Jenny. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it, the, the premise is a bunch of actors have to rehearse this Hamlet that they planned on doing on stage on Zoom and madness ensues. It's just, it makes perfect sense. To, and it's just great. I mean, of course, they're all tropes of all kinds of actors that we've grown to love in our career. But uh, I'm seeing so, I mean, I message her every day and go, submit to this, submit to this, submit to this. Those people are ahead of the game. They know that they can monetize this. Andrew, do you want to add anything? Because Clue actually, I think, plays pretty well with some of the interactive parts. Of course. Well, our version of Clue is written by our writer, Sarah Beale, to be specifically for this platform for our audience, which is largely probably a demo of 15 to 25, 35-year-olds who are in that in the know of let's go ahead and be internet culture very savvy. They're all part of the chat. They want to interact. And they want to go ahead and have conversations with each other while it happens. And so we wrote a very tongue-in-cheek designed for former high school theater actors, story about what's it like to reunite 10 years later and then get sucked into a board game of Clue where all your high school drama comes back up to the top. Yeah. And one of the most authentic moments in this was that we had a character, a guest uh, who came on, Jonathan Bennett, formerly of Mean Girls, also think of Cupcake Wars right now, who was the first person to be sort of sucked into Clue and the, uh, the inciting incident that someone goes in to try and find him afterwards. And when he gets sucked in and disappears, the entire chat starts going F, 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 F. And everyone's wondering, what does F mean? Why are they all saying F? And it's really one of the nerdiest things. A couple of years ago, there was a video game where you go to a funeral and you press F to pay respects. And so they're calling out an internet joke that we had no idea we were playing into, but they loved and had an authentic moment in response to. Andrew, I'm assuming you're familiar with, or they're familiar with you, uh, no proscenium and everything immersive, right? They are, yes. Yeah, I mean, if anyone's doing this kind of thing, they they will write about your stuff. Yeah, no proscenium's great. I've, I've already reached Thank out you. to Noah Nelson oh, no, to get yeah. him on the show, yeah. uh, because they also, they, they naturally went into this interactive, uh, and also the virtual world, which is, which is another segment of all of this uh, that's really exciting. Um, all right, let's go. I think we got time for one or two more questions. This is from Catherine Connor Duff. What advice would you give someone just starting out with this platform who doesn't want have a budget like $60,000? In your experience, are props, costumes, effects, et cetera, what audiences are responding to the most, or is it the writing within the scenes? I mean, it's got to be a good story. That's that's the basis of all art. <laughs> uh, it's got to be a good story. So that, that's the first thing. Uh, I would say, just like I mentioned Austin Cleon, I keep pointing to that the book used to be back there, um, that uh, you need a ridiculous, a solar powered blender, go on social media and ask who has a social, uh, a solar blender because you're creating a new piece of work that uses a solar blender. So you're getting your audience involved in helping you create this thing. And those people will still pay you to watch their blender in your show. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's about the story. Yeah, Andrew? I completely agree. I mean, I'm a designer first and foremost, and what design is about is elevating a story that already exists. It's about taking a narrative and then taking it up to the next level. And so you've got to start off with a solid foundation to go ahead and have design do anything. It can't just all be fluff. At the same time, I think that there's something to be said for looking at what is possible with a lot of money and finding ways to do it on the cheap. Taking inspiration from what's very cool out there and then doing it on your own way. The same way that we do in any intimate theater or when we look at what's being produced by the big boys out there. Yeah. 
you know, in the in the live show of kids, there's an entire bit about, oh, this character. Uh, so I'm not supposed to be doing the show. This character Sally is. Sally doesn't show up in the theater either. And she got all this stuff. She has a box, an empty box. Has anybody ever had any fun with an empty box? And the kids are like, ah, you know, they, <laughs> everything. It's a rocket ship. It's a television. It's a great part of the show. And I'm like, well, I can't do a box. It's not worth it to do a box. Well, we're in a pandemic and everyone is trying to save their toilet paper rolls. So that bit just became, she has an empty, to oh, she's got a bunch of empty. Has anyone ever had fun with empty toilet paper rolls? Oh, my God. Oh my God. Now, when I'm applying for grants, I'm teaching kids how to do use things around their house during quarantine. You know, it's suddenly like it's taken on a better, it, the, the show, I, I think when the show goes back to being on stage, it'll be a better show because yeah. I've learned that the stage show is about how to put on a show, but this show is what makes a good story. Yeah. That's what the show should have been about from the very beginning. That's a really great bit. That's a really great way of looking at this, of how this, the limitations of this, in a sense, has pushed you to be better storytellers and also pushed you to be more creative. Andrews had to reach out of his normal design realm and learn a whole bunch of new software to tell his story. You've had to go out and find things around the house and make bits based off that to tell your story. You're pushing the imagination. You're pushing the work. And I, I, for anyone who's doubting that this is live theater, I hope they can see this and see, no, this is, this is where it's at. This is really the new frontier and not to remove theater, but something new with it. That sounds like a nice little bit end. So what I'd like to say, um, before we actually give our adieus, um, what's your plan now when theaters open? Theaters are going to open um, audiences are going to come back. Are you still going to be doing the streaming? Are you going to be pushing the bounds of online entertainment, of toilet paper rolls and OBS? What's going to happen after this? Andrew? Streaming is not going anywhere. I, I'm convinced it's still a way to make your work accessible to an audience as well beyond who's in your, ge in your geographic proximity. I'm looking forward very much to going back to doing live theater and going to a bar after a show and at least hanging out with the cast and saying, okay, mm -hmm. we did something cool together. But at the same time, I don't think that sharing their work online and streaming it and having access to audience members around the world is going to be something that we can walk away from when we have a chance to produce work for people in the same, in the same room as us. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I would normally be in Edinburgh right now, uh, competing with three thousand other shows and having an international audience. And I don't, I don't have to, I don't have to go there anymore. I can just do this. I don't know what I'm having for breakfast tomorrow, so I cannot decide what's next. And I think that's a really good place to be, like just be in the moment, which is what good storytelling is too, and good performance is, is just being honest and in the moment. Um, I also do have a notion though that I can, you know. If I'm afraid of doing my shows because I'm going to lose the audience that will go to the actual theater show, just do my shows at times that normally people wouldn't go to the theater. So like the UK or Australia. Yeah, I might have to get up at two in the morning and do a show for Australia. But I, then I have a new story because I did a show in Australia. <laughs> yeah. Once again, both of you being innovative, pushing this the envelope of this, finding new ways of marketing, building your audience. Um, I just want to thank you guys so much uh, on behalf of all the audience because there's been, this is amazing, so cool. This is awesome. Um, this is so helpful. I mean, really, you guys, uh, and I know both of you guys have been very active outside of this of, of this streaming show. So thank you both very much. I'll be putting links up for everyone. Um, I also want to reach a thanks out to Miles Berman, who's been helping me uh, with the monitoring all the chat talks going out there. And Mr. David Svengali, who uh, designed the wonderful What's Next logo. Yeah, so we get some identifier out there. So we've got next week, we have actually two shows, uh, and it kind of overlaps some of what we talked to today. Uh, Wednesday, August 12th at noon, uh, we are going to be talking with artists and producers from the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, like Peter has mentioned. They're, it's going on right now, and we've got some producers and artists who are uh, performing online there. Uh, Alex Petty, Robin Perkins, and Jay Sodegar are both going to come online and talk about some of the things they've been working on. We're doing it at noon because that's 8 o'clock at night in England, so we kind of, kind of compromise there. 
And then the next day, Thursday, August 13th at 6 p.m., just by a week from today, uh, we're going to get two stage directors who pivoted from live stage directing to online streaming. Uh, and it's the wonderful Peter Kuo and Ashley Tada, uh, who will be talking about how they, in midstream, kind of went online uh, and got a lot of great press and recognition as well. So hopefully you guys will turn into that. Um, to the audience, everyone, guests, thank you so much for being on this premiere show. Uh, I am so looking forward. This was just a great way to start. You two were thank wonderful, you. wonderful. Thank you. I'm looking forward to more. Uh, keep the comments, spread the word. This will be archived and online and so you can share it. And I will be posting those links. So once again, everybody, thank you for coming. Thank you, Peter and Andrew, for all that great information. And I'm looking forward to seeing you next time on What's Next. See ya.